Hi everyone, welcome back to the 21 and Sensory podcast with me, Emily. On today's episode, I have the lovely Ashley Thompson. Ashley is 24 and works full-time as a project manager. Ashley is autistic and lives with her boyfriend, Charlie, who is also autistic. Now, you might know Ashley from her fab TikTok videos. She's at Ashley Fair, um, where she has over 35,000 followers. Um, And she also has a blog where she talks a lot about her experiences, realising she is autistic, and also just gives lots of helpful advice. So I will link um, Ashley's TikTok and blog, etc. in the show notes. Um, But yeah, Ashley, would you like to say hello? Hi, thank you for having me on. I'm so excited to be on a podcast. This is a personal dr- dream of mine. <laughs> <laughs> oh, bless you. Well, it means a lot that you, um, you're you up for chatting to me. And um, yeah, I have followed you on Instagram, I think a bit longer than I have on TikTok. But mm-hmm. yeah, it's going to be really interesting to chat to you and chat about kind of your journey with things. So maybe we could, I like to start with um, diagnosis. It always kind of um, leads to lots more interesting questions. Um, so sure. yeah, do you want to kind of discuss any diagnoses you have and how you kind of got them? Yeah, sure. I think um, my diagnosis story is a little bit of a weird one um, as far as my (laughs) autism diagnosis. So I didn't realise myself that I was autistic. In fact, I had no clue um, until I was about 17. Um, I had struggled a lot throughout, especially my teenage years. I struggled a lot just feeling kind of weird (laughs) and like Mm -hmm. I didn't really fit in um I had a lot of issues um kind of keeping friendships and I just I kind of just thought I was a really bad person because I was just thinking why don't I understand other people very well um and I just couldn't work it out and then when I was about 17 my mum actually uh was doing some volunteering for this program called Home Start where you kind of volunteers go in and they help out vulnerable families and Mm -hmm. the family that she was placed with had two autistic kids so she had to go on a training course about autism um and on that course they kind of like had the whole morning session and this woman was talking through kind of traits of autistic children and you know signs to look for and my mom kept putting her hand up the whole morning saying oh but my daughter does that isn't that a thing that everybody has and like oh and my daughter does that actually so it happened so many times that the woman giving the talk had to <laughs> pull her over at lunchtime and say um I think your daughter might be autistic um okay. so we had no idea but I guess Um, something that was quite disappointing from that situation is when the woman sort of talked to my mum she said you know is she doing well in school and academically I was doing great um, but in terms of my mental health it was really suffering but I kind of was so good at keeping them separate Um, (laughs) but obviously this woman just was like well if she's doing well academically there's no real there may not be a need for her to get a diagnosis so (laughs) I know (laughs) so my mom my mom came home and explained it all to me and at first I thought she was joking um, because I just I had in my head all of the stereotypes that people think about Mm -hmm. and I just was like well that doesn't seem like me but then we researched how it is in girls and women and the more that we looked into it it was like the only way I can describe it is there was all these weird little quirks about me and For example, you wouldn't have connected the fact that I struggled with friendships to the fact that when I'm excited, I do this little tick where I kind of itch my nose. Like (laughs) normally you you, normally you wouldn't connect those two things. But suddenly it was like, no, there is a connection and it all is linking together. Mm -hmm. Um, But as she said, I kind of just thought, well, okay, maybe I don't need a diagnosis based on what that woman said. Mm -hmm. So I continued like a few years, um, like through, I started uni and things like that. And I continued for a bit just thinking, okay, I know that I probably am autistic, but 
I didn't really feel valid enough to tell people because I didn't know how big of a thing self-diagnosis is as it is now. Um, so I didn't really feel valid mentioning it. I mentioned it to a couple of people, but I kind of passed it off like a, as a joke, kind of like, yeah, I think I might be autistic. Haha. <laughs> um, and then it wasn't until I think many people had this experience in the pandemic, everything was just kind of a massive shock. And for me, the change in routine was really, really hard. Mm-hmm. Um, and I just was having regular, really bad meltdowns and things like that. And I just thought this can't really be normal. And I started back at therapy again. I, I had seen by that point about four or five different therapists um, because nothing really was working. I didn't fully understand how to get better. And I kind of mentioned to her, I think I might be autistic, but I don't know if it makes a difference in terms of my therapy. Uh, and and she said, yeah, no, it absolutely would make a difference in how we approach your therapy. And I think it's worth looking into. So by that point, obviously, I'd had years of struggling with my mental health. And mm-hmm. I kind of sat down with my parents and I talked to them about it. And I said, look, my therapist thinks that it's worth me getting a diagnosis. We've known all this time that I probably am autistic. Um, but at the time, I was just struggling so much. I was just thinking... I don't know if I can deal with this like really long wait list. And so it was kind of the choice between, okay, I need to see a therapist as soon as possible, but do I continue with the same one who's not fully understanding me or Mm -hmm. do I go on the long way and not know? And it was just this really in between. So I was really lucky because we did some research and we found somewhere like private um, that wasn't too expensive So I went with that and then I managed to actually get my diagnosis pretty quickly, which I know is a huge privilege, but it kind of just felt sort of necessary with what was going on at the time. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. And then here I am, I guess. Mm -hmm. So am I right in thinking you were diagnosed? Was it 2021? Um, Yes. Yes, it was. It was just at the start in January, I think. Okay, so how old would you have been? Um, I was just turned 22 then and I'm just turned 24 now right okay so were you at uni like when you find found out kind of thing yes yeah I was literally kind of like I think midway through my final year of uni which is a really Ah. inconvenient (laughs) it's a really crazy time to realize that you're autistic (laughs) yeah exactly like did you did you tell the uni like what I mean you were coming towards the end like frustrating isn't it (laughs) yeah I did actually um and I found so that was kind of an interesting one in how the university dealt with it I found firstly the disability team at my university was incredible I cannot I cannot fault them because there was there's a woman that works there um Sarah and she literally saved my life in that she knows she's one of those people that really just knows everything and she's Mm -hmm. really understanding she has so much experience and she kind of she was meant to just basically have an initial meeting with me and explain like help me process my diagnosis and like kind mm-hmm. of offer the support but where I and especially initially I was really still struggling a lot and so she actually just set up weekly meetings with me where we would just kind of talk and she would help me unpack things okay and having that especially at the start of the diagnosis was so helpful because there were so many things that I just thought okay I don't understand where this is coming from mm-hmm. and she was great for that um but then I suppose yeah so that was a great experience I did also do um like a semester of a master's at the same university but that was a very different experience in terms of accommodations like I think the course had a different department and how Mm -hmm. they handled it was definitely not as positive (laughs) right okay that's wild how much it like you know, it's the same university, but like the accommodations can change or like fluctuate between like how receptive a department is, is wild. Yeah, absolutely. I think, bad. I think it has more to do with actually people's own individual judgments of mm. like autistic people. So, mm. I mean, for example, I had, I had a really awful meeting with two of the, um, two of the course leaders 
for that master's course and one of them was like oh well you don't seem autistic to me I never would have guessed and as soon as he said that as soon as he said that I was like okay I know I'm not gonna get any like you're not gonna get any understanding here (laughs) yeah I almost want to wanted you to ask him what he was expecting (laughs) that's the thing And also the thing is, I I sort of, that's where I explained to them the significance of like masking, because Mm. I said like, because of how heavily I mask, you will never see me like physically struggle in front of you. um, Because I have always like massively internalized that and kind of hidden it. So Mm -hmm. I was, but it's really hard to explain to somebody the amount of distress that you can experience behind closed doors when you mask and then yeah. you can seem perfectly fine face to face. Yeah. And they don't realise that actually you go home and you, you know, potentially are really burnt out or have like a meltdown because you have been holding it together just about exactly. all day. Exactly. <laughs> and then you just fall apart when you get home. <laughs> exactly. Um, that was definitely an experience in school, I think. Like yeah. My my mum and my brother f- used to dread picking me up from school because oh. I they nobody knew at the time, but I was obviously working so hard masking all through the day mm-hmm. that when I came home, I would just be so like short, so moody, mm-hmm. and just like having meltdowns almost every day because I was just I was just tired. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> pretty just, much like, <laughs> tired on you know a, a normal school day level, but also you know undiagnosed <laughs> autism Absolutely. and yes <laughs> just oh the sensoriness of a secondary school is terrifying <sighs> it yeah it's, it's it was way <laughs> it was way too much and I probably wasn't even fully processing it to the level that I would now if I went into mm-hmm. a school now it probably would be even worse <laughs> mm-hmm. but it just so. annoys me how how much like you you saying that you know academically you were doing really well and Mm. like I kind of felt that as well like I struggled academically but I was well behaved and yes if you're well behaved or and slash or are doing you know fine in classes that's how we're just going under the radar and it's so frustrating (laughs) that's the thing and I think it's really sad in a way but I think from a very young age I learned to kind of put on this front of seeming like everything's okay and basically just I think this is a really common experience with a lot of late diagnosed autistics especially it's Mm -hmm. the people pleasing like you learn so early on okay I have to seem okay to everyone else because I don't want to be a burden on them Mm -hmm. so it was just kind of like all through school I would just be having breakdowns at home and my mum would go into my teachers and say this is what's happening at home like she's crying every day she's having these horrible I mean she didn't know what was going on with the meltdowns but Mm -hmm. it was just horrific every single day and she would speak to my teachers about this and say you know just so you're aware if anything happens and they were like we we never would have guessed because in yeah. school she is so well, she's so like happy and bubbly and she's really hardworking. But mm-hmm. it was just, it, it was just tr- me trying so hard to make sure that no one saw that. <laughs> yeah. And you feel like you have to be that person at school. Like you want yeah. to fit in, you want to do well. Like, and you're right. It's like putting on an act every day, which yeah. is amazing when, you know, teachers are like, really? Like <laughs> they're like this at home. <laughs> That's the thing. I I could have I could have really gone on to be a great actress if I wanted to, because <laughs> I was really putting on the performance of a lifetime. <laughs> mm-hmm. And do you think, like, since finding this out about yourself, do you think mm-hmm. like you're able to drop the mask a bit, like since your diagnosis, or do you still find it quite like for me? I find it almost hard to know when I am masking because it's just kind of built into me. Like, how yeah. how do you find it now? Oh, do you know what? It is really hard because pe- people ask me <laughs> this a lot on TikTok as well. And I think it is really hard to know because it's so, especially if you're used to heavily masking, it's so mm. ingrained in you that it's almost, it's easier to mask than it is to unmask. And do you, the weird thing is when I was first learning to unmask, um, mostly it was just from spending time around other autistic people but I actually felt more vulnerable unmasking than I do when I mask because for me it feels just like 
it's a protective layer and if I let that go then everyone can see the real me and that's kind of scary (laughs) yeah um but I think what's been easier for me is really just finding other autistic people to be around um Mm -hmm. like and it's kind of happened by accident I think I got my diagnosis I started trying to be more myself and like I went into the goal of okay masking has clearly been causing me a lot of stress I'm going to try and stop that Mm -hmm. and it was kind of like my boyfriend I was dating him at the time but he had already thought that he was autistic and I was like yeah you absolutely are Um, (laughs) amazing (laughs) I was like yeah you are (laughs) And he got his diagnosis shortly after as well, um, off the back of that. And then I met my best friend, like my now best friend, um, like it was maybe, I don't know, about nine or 10 months after I got my diagnosis. And she actually, it was so weird. So we met at this volunteering program for the university and Mm -hmm she was kind of leading this talk and I was watching her and I was thinking she's autistic because you start to notice it in everyone <laughs> yeah you start to, you start to get a radar so I was just yeah thinking, she's autistic like I can see that she's stimming and stuff and I wonder if she knows but I'm I was thinking well I can't really just go up to someone and say hi you're autistic yeah. <laughs> <laughs> because you don't know how they're going to take that but she actually had found my TikTok already and oh. she was like oh I've seen your videos do you think I could be autistic I'm thinking of looking into it and I was like yeah you are like I really <laughs> I don't want to say anything but you are so it was kind of weird it was just I think being around other autistic people helps you to unmask because you realize there's no point in either of us masking because it's not yeah. doing any of us any help mm-hmm. um, but at the same time it's weird because the more you unmask the more you find other autistic people. <laughs> yeah. So it's it's actually a great way of making friends. But yeah, no, I completely would say it is really difficult. And I don't think I'm fully there yet. Um, mm-hmm. I think it's, it's just a, something that kind of happens as I get more comfortable with somebody. That's when, and I notice, for example, that I'm stimming more when I'm talking to them or I'm making mm. less eye contact, that's when I know, okay, we're in, we're in the sweet spot of, like, I yeah. feel comfortable to unmask around you. <laughs> mm-hmm. Oh, that's nice. Um, And you kind of mentioned a bit about, um, like, people finding you through your TikTok videos. Like, how how did you start that? Like, when, what was the kind of gap between diagnosis and kind of putting yourself out there online or was it quite a quick thing (laughs) yeah I think um I don't think I really I think my TikTok was kind of like a it's always been kind of like a slow burn um Mm -hmm. in the sense that I to be honest I just kind of go through periods where I'm super enthusiastic about it and then periods where it kind of burns me out a bit um but I found that I just I got my diagnosis and then I think very soon afterwards um I just was doing more research on TikTok really because that's the first place I think I saw um like Paige Lale's videos Mm -hmm. and um that was around the time I was thinking of getting a diagnosis and again it was just that extra validation of like oh she seems like me and she's autistic um and so I just started doing more research and finding more creators on TikTok who were autistic And I thought, oh, this is great. And I want to share my experiences and kind of see a lot of it in the beginning. uh, I think with my videos, I can see that it was kind of more just me asking if anyone else experienced stuff. Yeah. Um, Is there anyone out there? Yeah. yeah, Yeah. Most of them are like, is this just me? (laughs) Yeah. Um, Because I I wanted to just, I guess, there's so many things that you kind of have to unpack and be like, okay, is this an autism thing? Is this just a me thing? Most of it t- turns out is an autism thing. <laughs> um, yeah. But yeah, so I just kind of wanted to know more about it. And then I think I just had a few that kind of blew up. And then I was like, oh my gosh, I don't know what to do with this many people. This is crazy. But I think definitely seeing like some really nice comments just about how it helps people and the ones that really get me are the are people who are parents of autistic kids and they're maybe autistic themselves and mm. they're just like I'm trying to learn more so it's really great to hear from you that's 
really what motivated me to kind of keep going with it I guess Mm -hmm. and it must be nice as well to kind of almost like get this this feedback and see that other people are realizing kind of through their children as well that they might you know be autistic and are trying to not only help themselves but help their children at the same time that must be quite quite yeah um, quite a nice like feeling to be like oh you know your content is helping people of like different you know walks of life yeah definitely no I think it's it is funny when you see when you have those people who are like oh my kid's autistic and now I think I might be because yeah. nine times out of ten it always happens because it's obviously genetic so it's kind mm. of like it's come from somewhere and yeah even up till recently I thought my mum was fully like neurotypical and my dad's definitely the autistic one um but I thought she was fully neurotypical but then now I'm like oh no she definitely has ADHD <laughs> Okay. <laughs> and, and I've been like that's been my my next thing is maybe looking into wh- whether I need to get diagnosed for that but I don't feel as much of a pressure because I kind of understand myself better now anyway but mm-hmm. yeah <laughs> the fact that I just was thinking about it and then my mum was like yeah I have this thing where um I feel like I really need to rush my thoughts out before I forget them and I was like oh mum you do realize <laughs> I have something to tell you <laughs> yeah like almost like she told you about you being autistic you need yeah, to tell her <laughs> exactly we're like we're <laughs> diagnosing each other <laughs> yeah <laughs> oh bless I think it, like it's really interesting how like you like you said earlier like you could almost get like a radar for like other people and you kind of almost yeah. are like hmm like I don't want to say but I do want to say and then you're like how would I make a friend like how would I approach someone and it's like the kind of whole autism thing goes full circle you're like I want to pass it on that's the thing I feel it's actually crazy though because I feel like most times I haven't actually had to tell people because the people that I sense it with Mm -hmm. once they realize like oh that I'm openly open about the fact that I'm autistic nine mm-hmm. times out of 10, they just come up to me and they're like, Hey, I've been kind of thinking about this. And always I'm just like, yeah, you are like, don't worry. <laughs> I, I already sensed it. And yeah. it's it, the relief in their faces where they're like, Oh, I feel validated. Like she, Aww. she like, if somebody gets it and that's really mm-hmm. nice to see, it's so good when you just get, you find somebody who just understands it and validates what you're going through. Mm-hmm. And kind of leading off that like I'd be interested to know like after university how did you find like the world of employment and like have you told people that you work with have you not because this is something that I've also struggled with like yeah it's it's hard in a in like a professional setting let alone in a personal like you know just making friends and on like yeah. uni courses and stuff so how have you found like that side of it um I definitely have found it hard in terms of work um for a number of things so um I did tell the people at my current job that I'm autistic Mm -hmm. um but first of all I was so nervous and it was kind of it was really conflicting because I feel like a lot of it was partially kind of my own internalized ableism because I was thinking oh my god I don't want them to judge me I don't want them to think like I'm not capable of doing my job and I don't want them to just like you know because people have this idea of this of all the stereotypes and it's usually based on like autistic men and boys and that's that's not me in the sense that like I guess um particularly in autistic boys it's kind of it presents more sometimes in an anti-social way not all the time but Mm -hmm. in my case I'm very social I love to talk to people and what I don't want is for somebody to hear I'm autistic and immediately kind of be like okay well she doesn't want to talk then um which is not the case um so I was really I was really nervous to tell them but Mm. they kind of just were like okay that's fine um but I I, what I find most challenging is feeling sort of brave enough to ask for accommodations um so initially I didn't really ask for any at all I just basically said oh, I, I, I like clear instructions and that kind of thing. Mm-hmm. Um, but particularly as a job progressed, especially more recently, it's been really busy and I was just getting incredibly overwhelmed. I was having more and more meltdowns. And that was where I had to step in and set a boundary and say, okay, 
the amount of work, like this workload that you're putting on me, I Mm -hmm. feel this pressure to complete it because I'm such a perfectionist. And if you tell me to do something, my autistic brain is like, okay, I need to do it to the best of my ability. Yeah. Um, so (laughs) I was just basically completely burning myself out an insane amount trying to keep up with everything. Mm -hmm. And, uh, that was where I had to step in and say, no, this is a boundary, but I do think there's, I think work environments still have a, a lot of companies still have a long way to go in terms of fully understanding accommodations, because mm-hmm. I think they'll say, yeah, sure. Like I can give you clear instructions. I can give you clear expectations, you know, let, let us know if you're struggling anytime, but then nine times out of 10, they'll go back on their words. And yeah. that's the challenging part because you and it's not, what autistic people need to understand is that is not your fault or your problem. Like Mm -hmm. if you have a boundary and an accommodation that you need, then you need to just keep reminding them, Hey, this is what I've set for myself. This is what I'm doing. And Mm -hmm. it, but it's hard because you know, they need to meet you halfway really. (laughs) Yeah. Um, Yeah. You don't want to seem like a nuisance, but also you are entitled to like this accommodation yes. you know so it's tricky yeah. it's, it feels like you're negotiating but your mental yeah. health and well-being is at stake yeah yeah <laughs> so, that's a good way of putting it <laughs> yeah so yeah I've definitely found it tricky but I think I'm I'm coming out the other side of a difficult time now and I think um it's really it has really helped me to set the boundaries something that my boyfriend Charlie actually said to me one time when I was in many of the meltdowns that I had was if you allow them to treat you like this, if you allow people to, you know, not accommodate you or cross your boundaries, all you're saying to yourself is that you don't matter as much and that your feelings and your well-being doesn't, it comes below them. And every Mm. time that you do that, you're kind of pushing yourself further and further down And that's Mm. what's going to, that is what feels the worst because you're not doing right by yourself and you kind of know Mm. it. So I think that's why it's important to set those boundaries and and ask for the accommodations. Mm -hmm. And also like having a supporting partner who's like got your corner as well is always helpful (laughs) when you go home. (laughs) When you go home, you're like, oh, it's good to bounce ideas. (laughs) Absolutely. I think especially us both being autistic, it's kind of, funny and that we sort of play this fun tennis game of like who who is the most burnt out and then who can offer support (laughs) so we kind of like sometimes when he's burnt out it's like my turn to take over and be the support and then vice versa although I I seem to have a lot more meltdowns than he does so (laughs) I'm sure he I'm sure he wouldn't he wouldn't say that and that he's very um (laughs) very um up for looking after you but it's nice that you're there for each other and also that like you both like get each other like not yeah. just relationship wise but also like neurologically <laughs> yeah like, it must be nice to almost like you know obviously everyone is very different if they're like autistic but it, it must be nice to kind of be on the same page with a lot of things yes no absolutely I think like I've had relationships in the past where it just felt like they didn't fully understand me or It felt like for me, a massive thing with friendships and relationships is I had a lot of people who just made me feel like I was a burden um, Mm -hmm. and I was really hard work to be around. And it really kind of crushed me in a way (laughs) Um, Mm -hmm. because I obviously don't want to do that to people. But I think um, since being with Charlie, I think he's that's a really important thing that he's taught me is like I'm not a burden and Mm -hmm basically I just have like I have some extra needs in some case like you know everybody has different things that that they'll bring into the relationship different difficulties Mm -hmm. and he kind of gets them because he's also autistic and it's great to be able to just you know we can say to each other okay I'm feeling burnt out I just need some quiet time and we both just get it so Mm -hmm. that has made things so much easier in that sense (laughs) Mm -hmm. but I just think it's it's almost unfair on us that 
we kind of have to go through these potentially not very nice experiences to work yes. out that oh actually like I, I you know I am worthy like yes <laughs> like you know I, I do deserve like you know friendship or like a relationship and yes I do deserve to be like treated with respect and not have to change or you know even just like put on an act for like someone like you, yeah you deserve to be able to be yourself but yeah the fact that we you know no one teaches you these things <laughs> no no and I think something that people don't talk about enough either as well is I think especially when you're undiagnosed autistic it's kind mm. of like there's almost there's almost this like vulnerability about you in the sense that you are struggling but you don't know what's going on and mm. I think a lot of the times that actually you can fall prey to the wrong kinds of people like there are people who will manipulate you and you know it's horrible but they kind of like I think this is an experience I've heard a lot of other autistic people talk about it's kind of just you definitely fall prey to people who want to use you in some way or they'll just kind of put you down or things like that like I think it's quite a common experience and because we're so I think many of us are so blindly trusting in the people that we care yeah. about. Um, and that really can lead us into a lot of bad situations. Um, mm. And yeah, like you said, I think it's really horrible that for many of us, we have to go through those horrible friendships or relationships where we just don't feel valued or, mm. you know, we can be taken advantage of. And it's not until after when you kind of realize okay that's what was going on that Mm. you can start to not blame yourself (laughs) yeah yeah and I feel like also like you hear and are potentially more educated on things that are like more physical like manipulation rather than like emotional manipulation and I think that's where we as autistic people are really like vulnerable because you're just not aware and you're just not taught that actually that emotional manipulation is a thing and yes. you know that you need to be you just need to be like wary but like you say like like we're just so trusting and kind yeah. <laughs> and not taken advantage of that's the thing you don't you don't realize with when it's emotional and I yeah. had I had an experience with a friendship like that while I was at university um and it, it was definitely one of the hardest things I had to go through because this was a close friend and i I had told them, oh, I think I might be autistic. And Mm -hmm. I told them because I was so afraid with friends of saying we're doing the wrong thing because I'm autistic and I don't understand and Mm -hmm. hurting them. So I said, you know, if I say anything that, you know, may be offensive, like I promise I don't mean it, just explain to me like what I did wrong. I'll always be sorry. Like, I just don't want you to be offended by anything. Mm -hmm. and I think that that definitely that was a person where I didn't realize that I probably shouldn't fully trust them in that sense and it kind of it reached a point where they kind of would make me run everything by them in the friendship so it was like you know I'm thinking of texting this other friend to ask them and they were like okay you should say this you should say that and it became Uh, okay almost like it was too like controlling but I took it as, oh, they're just trying to help me. Like they're trying to teach yeah. me how to socialize properly. And mm. once I, even once I got out of that situation, I still found it really hard to trust my own judgment for things for months because I just thought, okay, I'm, I'm doing everything wrong. And, you know, I don't know how to talk to people and I'm a really bad person, but mm. that's an example which a lot of autistic people can fall into where it's it wasn't it wasn't my fault looking back but you know it's somebody coming in and they can see that you don't really know yourself so they're able to control that so that's something I think we all have to be a bit wary of (laughs) yeah and it's hard to not just be like wrapped up in the fact that like you're just thankful that you have a friend yes like someone who wants to you know talk to you like regularly and you know they're not annoyed by you and it's like oh great I have a friend um (laughs) but yeah you're right it's hard not to get like wrapped up in that and actually have you know take a step back and be like you know is this 
is this a healthy yeah <laughs> you know, friendship kind of thing but for sure yeah it's tricky unless you've gone gone through it or you know other people who have gone through it and know what to look for almost yeah but, yeah it's really interesting to like chat about it because mm. I do feel like you know it's it is like important to have friends but it's so hard to work people out <laughs> yes yeah, I think that's what makes it easier when you, if you can find good autistic friends, because yeah. now it's like, like um, with one of my best friends, Heather, I can literally, I just know, like I'm, I'm really into our friendship and she's really into the friendship too. And oh. it's just, it's kind of just easy in that sense because you understand each other and you can talk about your special interests together and it it just it just makes it easier when somebody like fully understands you on that level. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, I definitely agree. Like I was chatting to a couple of people the other day who are both autistic, and like one of them was just like, "Cause you know, just autism things," and and we like the other two of us were just like nodding, like, "Yeah, we get that." Yeah, <laughs> it's like just autism is just like you know the the kind of like way to explain things. Like she yeah. just explained this whole story, and she was like, "Yeah, just." just autism and we were like yeah (laughs) I think I think I was talking the other day I was saying it what I feel grateful with um uh with my friend Heather my boyfriend Charlie is like for example if we do a day out somewhere so if I do a day out in London like doing Mm -hmm. loads of stuff um I obviously get really burnt out because it's really loud and busy um and so do they but it's great because if if I've gone on a day out with like a neurotypical I feel pressured to like still talk to them on the train and you know things like that yeah but it was great because anytime I've gone on a day out um with like other autistic people I have just kind of like vegged out on the train back <laughs> like we all ju- we'll both just like put our headphones in not say anything and just kind of decompress and mm-hmm. that is so nice just to be able to you know know that okay this is what's going on and like with yeah. Heather I think we got like halfway through the day it was getting to lunchtime and she was I was watching her get quieter and quieter and I was mm-hmm. just saying yeah you're getting burnt out you need some food <laughs> <laughs> so yeah being able to like just not have that pressure is so good <laughs> mm-hmm. and like just also the fact that you're recognizing it in others like oh I know that yeah <laughs> I know exactly. that feeling <laughs> exactly it's just there's no need to explain you just get you just get it <laughs> mm-hmm. and also like finding those people in your life that like you can like sit and read a book with or like enjoy each other's company but in silence like yes I, those people are so hard to find but they're so great <laughs> I know that's that's the thing is um me and Charlie do that a lot with like body doubling um Mm -hmm. where we'll each do our own thing and it it used to make me laugh because in previous relationships it's like um I had like a an ex who was just like oh do you mind if I go and play video games with my friends and I was like please do like (laughs) yeah I don't I don't get I never understood the whole like I don't want my boyfriend to be playing video games I'm like I will very happily just sit in the same room as you reading a book for me that's yeah. quality time like yeah and like, almost you, like you need that space sometimes yeah, like <laughs> totally yeah. like just doing your own thing in the same space is yeah. 100% an autistic love language <laughs> yeah absolutely <laughs> you can just both be happy both doing your own thing <laughs> exactly yeah it's it, it's almost it is totally necessary because it's just there's no effort required um mm-hmm. it's great <laughs> <laughs> and how do you find like so all the things we've kind of talked about like obviously you have a job I have um you know friends and a boyfriend and um like obviously doing all the like digital like content stuff as well with all the videos and things like do you are you someone that kind of likes a routine or like a structure like how do you balance all these things yeah it is it's definitely quite hard I think I'm still trying to figure out how to actually manage my life really to be (laughs) honest I think um I think the autism side of my brain definitely needs a routine. Um, Mm -hmm. But then on the other hand, I think the undiagnosed ADHD is like, okay, well, I don't want to follow a routine. So like it's, it's hard because I'll set a, I'll put a routine in place. I'm like, yep, this is what I'm going to do. And it lasts a little bit. And then my brain's like, yeah, I'm bored. Let's mix it up. So (laughs) 
Yeah. I, I guess really the main thing that I find works for me, which I'm still working on, is just increasing like my self-awareness. I think being aware of my own needs is not something that I was in the practice of doing because um, I mm-hmm. think masking for so long growing up that's all about basically just suppressing how you're feeling and not really being aware of how you're feeling. But Mm -hmm. I think nowadays I try to be much more just in touch with my brain and my body and just kind of know, try to work out how I'm feeling. I think, um, I definitely think I may have that kind of overlapping thing with autism, um, alexithymia where you can't really, identify your emotions um so that makes Mm -hmm. it a challenge but for example um I have a really good system with Charlie where he'll say how are you feeling on a scale of one to ten and um having that check-in every so often is really good just to be like okay because once I think about the number I'm thinking okay I'm sort of mentally at a a nine but I'm physically at like a four because I'm really tired or okay things like that so I think that's what I'm trying to, that's how I'm basically trying to learn to cope with, um, especially when things are busier, is just basically checking in with myself. And Mm -hmm. I think I'm just, I sort of, even my approach is different. And I think that helps because when I was younger, I'd obviously have things like meltdowns and burnout, but I'd just be thinking, what is wrong with me? Like, why can't I pull it together? Like, why can't I do what everyone else is doing? I don't understand. Whereas now my approach is like, okay, well, I feel really exhausted today. I'm probably going into, but I'm probably starting burnout. So Mm -hmm. I'm just going to allow myself to be in bed this morning and wear comfy clothes and just chill and regain some energy. And Mm -hmm. even just having, it's sort of like approaching yourself as as you would a friend and just being more compassionate and thinking okay why could I be feeling like this and what would help me and that's Mm -hmm. definitely that's definitely what's helped me going forward more so than even routines and stuff actually just just checking in with myself I'd say is the biggest has been the biggest help Mm -hmm. and do you find like since your diagnosis like just just knowing you're autistic, do you feel like you're kinder to yourself and like you cut yourself some more kind of slack because you kind of know the reason? Because that's kind of how I've sort of found it where yeah. I'm just like, God, I just need to cut myself some slack. Like I'm dealing with a lot and I know what it is. <laughs> yeah, that's the thing. I, I I would describe the day that I got my diagnosis as by far the best day of my life. And oh. some people some people find that hilarious, but other autistic people get it, I think, because... Yeah. It was just, I can only describe it as this huge weight being lifted off my shoulders because Mm -hmm. before that day, I had gone, what, 22 years of my life just feeling like I'm a terrible person, I'm a burden, I've got all this weird stuff about me that like nobody else seems to understand and I have Mm -hmm. no idea why I do it. Like, why am I so sensitive? Why do I break down so easily? And then it was kind of just this, I just had this like switch flip in my mind where I realized after I got diagnosed, literally that evening, I just thought, you know what? This isn't my problem anymore. Like Mm -hmm. I've spent 22, (laughs) I've spent 22 years like trying to learn about other people and trying to like analyze their behavior and like, okay, should I say this? Should I do this? And like questioning myself. And I just realized I've got a legitimate reason why I don't have to do that anymore. And in fact, Mm -hmm. they should start trying to learn how to understand me. (laughs) Yeah, why is it always on us? (laughs) Exactly. Like after that, I was like, I have no worries. Like I'm just going to start saying to people, I'm autistic. So that's why I don't get it. And if you have a problem Mm -hmm. with that, I don't know, leave. (laughs) Yeah. Um, So it was just this huge weight off of my shoulders because I realized, okay, I'm not a bad person. I Mm -hmm. just don't understand some things because I'm autistic and you know Mm -hmm. people just need to learn how to get that I guess (laughs) yeah and people just don't realize that like you were saying like kind of analyzing other people's like behavior and you know even things like facial expressions and stuff like that like yeah you almost don't realize there's this like constant inner 
like monologue going on in oh. like where it's kind of throwing you suggestions of how you might survive in this yeah. <laughs> environment where actually like it shouldn't all be on us like I can know. someone else take the slack off us and like, I know. it's yeah. literally never end and that's that's definitely been another part of unmasking is like I had that realization but then it's still trying to undo those habits of just yeah. overthinking every single thing and I've actually got better at it in the work sense because when I first I, I send so many emails a day. But when I first was working, I had to read back every email about three or four times and check mm. that I seemed friendly enough. Now I just don't care. I'm just like, you know, <laughs> you know what? If the information's clear and it gets the point across, I don't care yeah. if I'm like really, really nicey, nicey. Like I'm just gonna, yeah. I'm just gonna say what I'm thinking um, in the email, mm-hmm. and you know, I'll be polite, but I'm not putting. Yeah. Tone as is much. so weird. <laughs> yes, I know, and it's just. <laughs> Like, I think I used to just come off as, I probably came off, to be honest, as a bit like uncanny valley. I think, <laughs> I think because right. any, any interaction I had, I probably was just trying so hard to be overly friendly that everyone was thinking, can she chill out a bit? Like, <laughs> um, <laughs> so I think actually putting less effort in has in a way made me seem like more normal. <laughs> I see (laughs) it's hard though because you're like where do I pitch it like I want to seem enthusiastic and I want to seem like you know professional but then you're also like almost monitoring everything you do and say and that's a lot in itself (laughs) and I still have moments where I'm just like I'll feel like yes I really nailed that but then there'll be some moment of the interaction that I think about afterwards and I'm just like physically cringing because I I look back like why did I say that why did I do it why did I do that thing and I'll just so it's I'm definitely one of those people that would just stay awake at night just thinking about all yes the bar- just in lying bar- there like <laughs> oh <laughs> why did I do this oh god uh, yeah it's so I'm so bad for that but I feel <laughs> it's just it's just that old masking tendency of just yeah. like I need to get an a star at socializing and it's just like it's, it's yeah. fine you really don't have to it's okay <laughs> yeah and I always try and think like I am probably the only person thinking like rethinking this over like the other person's yeah. moved on with their life and I wish I was them but <laughs> oh yes like, so annoying literally everyone around me like my my parents my friends Charlie they're always telling me that like you, nobody else is thinking yeah. about this as much as you are <laughs> yeah but it's just like it's just my brain it's just how it is yeah and that's the thing I don't I don't analyze other people's interactions like I don't think no. oh my gosh that's so embarrassing that they just did that but yeah. <laughs> for some reason my brain doesn't get that like the same rule applies to me <laughs> yeah what is with that <laughs> I, I don't know I wish that, I wish I could send my brain a message just relax a bit <laughs> yeah that would be great <laughs> um uh, and I wanted to ask you about mm-hmm. I like to ask all my guests about like their hobbies and special interests sure I'd be very keen to chat about all things right move, pyramid schemes, <laughs> other things I've seen on your TikTok where you're like, is it just me? <laughs> and I'm with you on the right move thing. Pyramid schemes, I'm I'm keen to learn more about, but right move, I am, and Zoopla, I'm obsessed with. <laughs> yes. See, I, I think my special interests are a bit weird in the sense that I don't think I have as many like ongoing like really intense ones I think the way my special interests manifest is maybe more the ADHD side of like hyper fixating on things because Mm -hmm. like for example the other autistic people around me I see that their special interests last at least months if not years Um, and I have a few that I will kind of circle back to like broad areas like um, beauty or like hair stuff or whatever Mm -hmm. um, or fashion but I think most of the time I just have these like weird hyperfixations that last for a few months and then I move on to something else um mm. so yeah right move is definitely my one that's been going on for like a few months but okay. I li- I literally have the app and I I check right move the way that people check Instagram like <laughs> amazing <laughs> if I'm bored I just scroll right move but and it's great because I'll just be I don't know I just loved watching like okay this is what the prices are doing what's going on in this area like yeah and stats yes (laughs) exactly but when when I try to explain it to people I just sound crazy because they're just like (laughs) this is not interesting at all like why are you talking to me oh you've come to the right place on my podcast (laughs) this is where this is where we love 
all, all things, um, you know, random special interest. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, with the, the pyramid schemes as well, that was one for like a few months. And it was it's just mm-hmm. kind of one of those things where I know it's happening because it'll be like 2 a.m. and I'm watching multiple YouTube videos or like researching something. I'm like, oh no, amazing, <laughs> it's starting again. <laughs> but it's wow. but but it's yeah, that's the thing. If it's so, other people I feel have like sort of more convenient special interests because they last longer and they're more on like accessible topics. Like Charlie's are like yeah. Lego and plants and that kind of thing. Mine mm. are just like so weird that it's like, how do I, <laughs> how do I start a conversation with somebody about pyramid schemes? <laughs> like not trying to get them into one, just trying to explain yeah. like pyramid schemes are like cults and this is interesting yeah. to me. <laughs> yeah. You're like, I promise I'm not trying to sell you into one. Yeah. Like. <laughs> but it's just, Amazing. yeah, that's, that's why I, I physically have to surround myself with other autistic people because nobody else would get it and I need to talk to someone about it (laughs) yeah yeah I like how specific they are as well like they're so specific so Mm -hmm. and I can't even work out I can't even work out where it comes from it's just kind of I'll be doing another one for a while was LinkedIn and I think that was just because it's basically around what I've been thinking about or doing so like when I was looking for jobs, I was on LinkedIn and then I became fixated on looking for jobs. Like even after I found a job, I still wanted to look (laughs) for jobs just because I I enjoyed it. And Mm -hmm. same with Rightmove, we were like looking for a flat and then we found a flat and I was just like, oh, but I enjoyed looking on Rightmove. Let me just continue doing that. Yeah. But also you find out a lot about your area by like being on it pretty, you know. Totally. Like my, my current fixation is watching the house prices like go down because I think especially with everything going on at the moment there seems to be Mm. a little bit of a market crash happening and I like to just look at places around London be like oh that's definitely come down that wouldn't be that wouldn't have been that cheap before (laughs) like maybe we'll be able to like afford somewhere if we really really save Mm -hmm. (laughs) I think you should go into like property like advising (laughs) I feel like you'd be like this is the area to be in (laughs) That's the thing. Next time we're looking for a place and I have to deal with estate agents again, I'm just going to be like, look, listen, I I know more than you do. So, <laughs> you know yeah, that, you're like, you, I know the market. <laughs> it's that meme of like, uh, I think Ron Swanson from Parks and Rec, where he's like, I know more than you do to the, the guy who's in the <laughs> shop, because that's literally yeah. how I feel like. <laughs> it's And it's the most random thing. So it's, it's it will just pop up. Somebody will be talking about something so obscure and I just realise, oh God, that's been a previous fixation of mine. And (laughs) suddenly I'm just off on a ramble (laughs) and I'm just like, and you know, you can start to tell you're like, oh gosh, I know I've gone too far. Like I know I need to shut up, but you physically can't. Like when you're in the Mm -hmm. info dump mode, you just, there's no going back. (laughs) (laughs) So are those like your two main ones at the moment? Yes. Or have you got those I'd, are the two main ones okay I think yeah they were right move is definitely a big one I think um uh I think I've got more into like hair again like I go through different phases where it's basically like if there's styles that I like I'm like okay I want to mm-hmm. do that and then I fixate on it so I've mm-hmm. like recently been obsessed with learning how to do the perfect blow dry with like the rollers in my hair and everything oh, um, okay so, but it's yeah it's definitely more than a normal person would because it's like mm-hmm. I want to do this like every day until I get it perfect. Okay, and I then get you. <laughs> I'll move on to the next thing. So <laughs> I I literally had that the other day. Like for like the past week, I've been on TikTok looking at like heatless curls and how people achieve yes. them with like different implements, like like a dressing oh gown gosh. cord or socks or yes. like a silk thing. And I'm like, how could I achieve this without? it just destroying me sensory wise because obviously you have to like sleep in it yeah. and I've got kind of long hair and I'm like how could I and I've just like gone down a massive hole a bit <laughs> see I, I had that was definitely a big one when I was like a teenager I, I got into the heatless curls and that was one that I definitely was fixated on because it was I tried ever there was one point I think I was doing it with like pencils in my <laughs> Oh my god, I've seen that. <laughs> I, How comfortable I, is that? <laughs> it is not comfortable. I think the only one that mm-hmm. I found that worked for me was doing like four mini buns at the very top of my head. 
because then right, okay. you can lie on your side and it's not going to like really hurt you but you get some like uh, nice curls in the morning but okay. <laughs> that was one that I really was obsessed with so I kind of I kind of revisit general areas sometimes mm-hmm. and like hair and makeup and that kind of thing that's definitely mm-hmm. one of them I think I can feel maybe the beginnings of another makeup phase coming in which isn't good because Makeup and skincare is so expensive <laughs> to get hyper fixated on because you're just yeah. like, I want to buy every product. And then a few months mm-hmm. later, you just don't use any of them. Yeah, yeah, I get what you mean. Although I do find like things like unboxings on YouTube, you almost get the same kind of satisfaction from like, if you want to yes. buy something and you can like watch someone and like see the texture of it, especially like, I guess with makeup and things like that, like you can almost like try it before you buy. Yes. Like through influencers. <laughs> yeah. I, lo- I love, the thing is, I know that even if I know at, at my big age now, I know that even if I bought all of those products, it's not going to hit the same when I'm doing it. So I just need yeah. to watch other people do it and it looks flawless on them. And I just need to mm-hmm. get the satisfaction from that. <laughs> it's so hard though like the amount of self-control you need on like social media these days because it's like I don't know I just feel like everything has a has a link or a shop and you're like I know (laughs) I know believe me I know because I can definitely I can see like more like makeup get ready with me's coming on and there's like all the TikTok shop links I'm like oh don't don't go into this because you're just going to buy everything that's on this list and your bank account (laughs) does not have the facilities for that yeah see we're vulnerable as autistic people to these things as well like exactly just, oh. the the impulse buying is is no good like uh, we need dopamine mm-hmm. in other other areas because exactly it's, it's a cost of living crisis we don't have the money to be doing that <laughs> no no you're very right and like you say in a few months time you'll look back at the stuff and be like damn it that, <laughs> at the time a, I needed this <laughs> I have as, I have as a permanent reminder like pretty much a whole collection of makeup that I bought like several years ago in Sephora I just went mad in like we went on holiday and there was a Sephora and I just bought okay everything that everybody was talking <laughs> about so that box is a reminder to me because I'm like you never <laughs> use that and it's just sitting there so mm-hmm. it's a visual <laughs> yes like let's not do that again <laughs> that's 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 a good way of doing it just like put it in your like line of sight as a reminder (laughs) oh amazing I can't believe I always say this I can't believe I've spoken to you for an hour it's gone like really quickly (laughs) I know I wish I could like go for another hour because it's (laughs) it's nice (laughs) to just chat (laughs) yeah well I every so often I like to do like catch-ups with like people that I've spoken to before because it's always nice to just be like so how are you doing now so maybe we could do that in like a year's time or something like it'd be nice to like catch up and see how you're doing um I think podcasts yeah. are made for me because I just love to chat so absolutely <laughs> I'm I'll come back anytime <laughs> amazing <laughs> um I feel like we should mention some of your social media links so people can find you so do you want to just just absolutely promote the hell out of yourself <laughs> sure um well I think so my TikTok is Ashley Fair and it's the same username for TikTok Twitter and Instagram so that makes it easy for everyone um okay and my blog is ashleythompson.co.uk. Um, everyone always asks me where the fair comes from. It's actually my middle name. So, <laughs> but Thompson's oh. Thompson's way too popular to use for a username. So that's why. <laughs> but yeah, it's it it nice. Know. It's different. <laughs> yeah. Oh, and I have a Goodreads as well, but I don't actually know what that is. I think it's linked in my. I've got like a little link tree on my tiktok Ooh, okay. so if, if anyone wants to follow me on goodreads that's another hyper fixation at the moment <laughs> oh, God, i'm obsessed with goodreads i love that it gives you the percentage of the way yes! you know, like through the book you are i need yes! that <laughs> <laughs> i will follow you after this Perfect. lovely <laughs> amazing <laughs> it's so oh i get like so like fixated on other people's reviews and like how people like star it and stuff yes. or like oh it's, no, it's, I, I write yeah. detailed reviews. Don't worry. Oh, do I, you? I give, oh, like, amazing. I give updates. Every time I add a percentage, it gives me like a little dopamine rush. So yeah, yeah, I'm with you. Okay, great. We can we can be good reads friends. Lovely. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you so much for um, coming on and um, for chatting with me. We will have to catch up again soon. <laughs> yes. Thank you so much for having me.